On today's show, we get an up-close look at the life of a salmon. and welcome to another great episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Katie. And I'm Drew. Today we're back in Alaska, where we're going to be learning all about the projects and technology that are allowing us to learn more about salmon populations. Yeah, we will. Then we'll see how all the information that is gathered through these projects is used to protect and conserve the salmon and their habitat. I'm even going to get a chance to help out in the efforts by assisting in pit tagging some fish. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Let's go. We're here at Jim Lake in the Kinnick River Valley in Alaska, where we're gonna learn about anadromous fish. Well, Clark, I have no idea what anadromous means. <laughs> so let's go talk to Jay from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and find out. Yeah, let's go. So Jay, what does anadromous mean? Well, anadromous, as it refers to fishes, are those fish that are born in the freshwater environment, like this lake or small creeks, move into the saltwater environment, the ocean, to grow, to feed, to become bigger, and then when it's their time to spawn, they return to their same natal stream to reproduce. And what types of anadromous fish do you have here in this lake? Well, here in Jim Lake, we have coho salmon and sockeye salmon. What families of fish are anadromous? Well, of course, the salmon, all five species of salmon here in Alaska, but also smelts, like the hooligan, lamprey, whitefish, for example, shefish. How many water bodies are included in the catalog, lakes, rivers, and streams? There are approximately 18,000 water bodies in wow. the catalog. How does a water body become part of the catalog? Well, it's, it's an interesting process. It starts, starts out with simple observations. You know, whether you go out with traps, like we're going to do here, or flying over with an airplane looking at adult fish, or other means that we can go in and we actually can capture and physically look at the fish to determine what species they are. So can we go and try to identify some fish? Yeah, sounds like fun. Let's go. Okay. You guys go ahead and hop in, and I'll hold it steady, and then we'll push off. Right. I call the pink seat. I've got it, so go ahead. Here we go. Okay, everybody ready? Yeah. Okay, grab your paddles. Let's go. Ah. Wait, I have short little arms for this. So what might we find in these traps? Well, if we're lucky, we're going to find some little coho salmon and maybe some little sockeye salmon. And when you say little, do you mean juveniles? Yeah, they would be probably either out of the egg this year or possibly last year. Coho can remain in residence in uh, freshwater for up to four years. Oh, wow. So close. All right, there you go. I got it. Ah! Got it? OK. Pull it up. The water's cold. Yeah, nice and clear. Oh, we got a mess of fish there. Woo! Oh, wow. Oh, wait. Yeah. They don't have water. Well, let's put them in a bucket here. That's a good idea. A little there, bit of their environment. Here, you just want to hand it over your left shoulder there. Thank you. OK, let's pour the fish down and so they, they stay alive. Here we go. Looks like we got them all. What do we have in here? Well, it looks like we've got a few sticklebacks. Uh, we've got a salmonid of some kind. Based on its <gasps> oh, size, <laughs> I would say it's probably wow. a little coho salmon. Oh. Probably been here for a couple of years. Oh. So what does the sample mean? Well, it tells us that there are indeed uh, an anadromous fish in this stream, or mm -hmm. in this lake, since we have a little coho salmon. Like that, probably a couple of years old. 
Um, looks like there's a couple of different coho salmon in here. Uh, mostly everything else are non-anatomous fish, which are resident fish like sticklebacks. That's what these look like to me. So they're all native? Yeah. Yep. They all live here. I uh, see the coho will be here for a couple of years and then gradually make their way out from here go downstream into the Connect River, from the Connect River into the ocean, from Cook Inlet out into the North Pacific where they will feed, grow, until whatever biological clock tells them it's time to return here in order to spawn. I usually think of baby salmon as growing up in streams, but this is a lake. What does that mean? Well, it's uh, the coho salmon are real adaptive for one thing, so not only can they rear successfully in rivers, lakes, streams, creeks, but they can also take advantage of this really prime in, uh, habitat and uh, rear quite successfully in the lake. So it's lakes, it's wetlands, it's streams, it's all water bodies that are really important to salmon and other anadromous fish. Oh, absolutely, especially coho salmon. I mean, they will be in areas that if you look at it just visually, you would not believe there'd be a little salmon in there, but once you sample it, that little fish will come boiling out of everywhere. It's actually pretty amazing. <laughs> wow. It's great that the anadromous waters catalog is offering protection to all of those different water bodies containing some of the anadromous fish that we saw. Yeah, you're right, Drew. You know, it's so important that the Anadromous Waters Catalog is in place because it really helps to protect the fish that are so vital to Alaska's diet and economy. That's true. Don't go away because when Aqua Kids returns, we're going to get a chance to track some salmon by pit tagging. Aqua Kids presents another Aqua Kids pop quiz. The Chinook salmon is the official state fish of Alaska. This robust fish eats plankton, insects, amphipods, and other fish, and can live for up to seven years. How big can they get? Is it A, two feet long, B, three feet long, or C, four feet long? Get your measuring tape and meet me after the break for the answer. Did you guess how big the Chinook salmon can get? The answer is B, three feet long. There are, however, records of larger Chinook salmon being caught one measuring 58 inches and another weighing 126 pounds. And that's no fish story. Alaska, Alaska. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. We're headed back to Alaska where we're gonna be learning all about how pit tagging helps to track where fish are traveling. That's right, Katie. Plus the information that's gathered can be used in a variety of ways to help out with conservation and protection. Sweet, let's go check it out. We're here in Fish Creek, which leads into Big Lake, part of the Matsu Borough in Alaska. We're going to be working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, learning all about pit tagging. Culverts present a barrier to fish, and it disturbs their natural life cycle. Pit tagging is a great way to track where the salmon are going, so we can decide which culverts are presenting the biggest issue. Well, John's going to give us an overview of how this whole thing works, so let's go. Okay. Hey, John. Hi, Katie. We were just wondering, what is the significance of Big Lake? Well, Big Lake's located in the Matsu Borough, and it's in the fastest growing area of the state. So with such a growing population, does this present any issues for the fish? Well, growing population means more roads and more infrastructure, and roads and infrastructure cross over the river, and that causes problems with fish passage for fish. Right. Is there any way that you can track the amount of harm being done? We can't track the harm, but we can track where the fish are going, so distribution-wise and migration-wise. And how do you do that? We tag fish with pit tags, they're passive integrated transponders, they're about the size of a grain of rice, wow. and we insert them into a fish and track them throughout the drainage. So pit tags are inserted under the skin of the fish, does it hurt them in any way? They are inserted under the skin, they're about the size of a grain of rice, and we put them in the abdominal cavity of the fish, Okay. and it doesn't appear to hurt them. Okay, how long do the tags last for? The tags last for the life of the fish, so there's no batteries involved with a pit tag, as long as the fish is moving and, and alive, then we can track the fish. How do the tags work? Well, the tags are passive, so there's no battery or anything like that attached to the tags. The only time they give you a signal is when they pass through antennas like this. And the antennas pick up a electronic signal. It's 13 digits long. It's like giving the fish a social security number. Have you learned anything new about the fish since setting this antenna up? We have. The big thing we've learned is where they're overwintering. So in the summer, in June and July, they're primarily in main stem reaches like this. In July and August, they'll move into smaller areas, in, into tributaries, and those connect with lakes. And it looks like most of the fish are overwintering in lakes. Is it unusual for these fish to be overwintering in these lakes? 
Well, we really didn't know where they were, were overwintering. We knew they were sort of targeting areas with low current, so places where they could kind of conserve energy and have a lower metabolism. We just didn't really know which lakes and, and when they were moving there. And which species are using these lakes? We are tagging only juvenile coho salmon in this particular project. So those are the bright red ones this time of year? The uh, bright red oh, ones yeah. are sockeye, sockeye. Yeah. and coho will turn bright red, but not as bright as the, as the sockeye. So only a few years ago, no one really knew where these salmon lived, and now you have all this information. What are you going to do with it? Well, that ties back into the goal of the project, and the goal of the project was to make sure fish could have free, uninhibited passage to all of the areas that they needed. Now that we've learned a little bit about pit tagging, I hear Rachel and Drew are going to get a chance to tag some fish. Do you want to check that out? That's right. Let's go get their hands wet. Yeah. Hey John, looks like we got a pretty good uh, haul of coho here today. Yeah Josh, hour 22 soap time. Perfect. Hey Josh, John. So I would assume the first step to pit tagging would be to catch the fish, right? Absolutely. And how do you do that? We uh, set minnow traps for about an hour, sometimes a little bit more, uh, baited with uh, some salmon row and uh, go and haul them out in a little bit and we generally get, you know, wow. between five and seven coho and some other species mixed in as well. So what do we have in here? Well, let's take a look. Okay. Normally we like to uh, take them out of the minnow trap and put them into a holding bucket before we uh, start to work them up. So okay. we can identify them at the same time. Um, if we can get one of you guys to hold this bucket for us, it would be sure. great. And how many traps do you have in this area right here? We set about six traps today. Okay. Well, let's see what's in this one. Perfect. Let's dump it right into the holding bucket here. Are you looking for any fish in particular? We're specifically looking for the juvenile coho, but we will get some uh, other species such as stickleback and sculpin and rainbow trout. Cool. And the occasional sockeye salmon as well. All right, let's identify these. Perfect. All right. Looks like we got a rainbow trout here. We'll just put this one back in the stream because we're not after it. Okay. Same thing with this other rainbow trout right here. This, however, is a juvenile salmon, so we'll put that one into our first holding tank. Oh, it's little. We have another juvenile salmon. Do you know how old these are? Oh, the, the really little ones here are probably year zeros, which means that they hatched out of the gravel earlier this year. Okay. Those were a couple stickleback on the side. And we'll get this sculpin out of here. Oh, that one's cool. Yeah, big old head, big pectoral <laughs> fins. All right, back into the stream with him. Now, what are we going to do with these? Uh, we're going to put a little anesthetic in here that's going to put the fish to sleep. Uh, so they really don't feel when we insert the pit tag into them mm -hmm. or do any of the measurements. We really want to reduce the amount of handling stress that we have on the right. fish as we're working them up. So this will be a anesthetic tank and then this one will be a recovery tank of just fresh water. Okay. Okay. So the next step is we're going to add the anesthetic to the water to uh, help put them to sleep so they don't feel the pit tag. Anymore. How long does it normally take for the anesthetic to take effect? Uh, generally just a couple minutes. Uh, a couple of these fish look pretty small. Can you even put a tag in them? Uh, no, you can't. We actually have a minimum tagging size of 55 millimeters. What do you do with the small ones? We still take a length and weight on them and then just put them into the uh, recovery bath and then release them back into the stream for them to grow up so we can tag them uh, in a couple weeks, hopefully. Yeah. I think we'll have you guys take some data today. Right, cool. Uh, write down the lengths and weights as we uh, measure the fish up and you guys can even uh, measure a couple here at the, at the end. Great. Do the small ones look ready to start getting measured? Absolutely. All right, so we're going to measure some uh, the smaller ones right now. And we do this in uh, millimeters and it's a fork length. So we're gonna measure from the tip of the nose to the, where the fork of the tail is. Oh, okay. So how big do you think that fish is? How about 43 millimeters? Oh, perfect. And then we actually get a weight on them as well. So we have the scale over here, we zero it out and drop them in. <laughs> and this one is one gram. So you can go ahead and write down 43 millimeters and one gram for that fish. So can we tag one? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Some of the bigger ones that are can accept a tag are, uh, are asleep at this point. So we'll just pull them out. We have to do the same thing as before when we do the, the length and the weight first. All right, let's see. Uh, it's like 83. Yeah. And then we'll drop them right out. We'll get the, the weight on them over here. Put this back on there. 8.5. 8.5 grams. So the first thing we do after we've done the length and the weight on a tagging fish is we, we cut the adipose fin off as a secondary mark so that if we get a, catch this fish again, we know it already has a tag in it. Okay. And then finally, the tag comes in a preloaded needle. We just kind of slide it gently into the body cavity and pull the trigger. And it inserts the tag into the body cavity, give it a little rub, 
And you guys can see there's hardly even a mark there where we went oh, in. Yeah. We just drop them into recovery, and in a couple minutes, the fish will be swimming around, ready to go back out into the wild. Great. So how long do these tags last? Uh, these last these tags last for the life of the fish. There, there's no battery involved, so the only time that they actually are picked up is when we use one of the handheld readers that we just used mm -hmm. uh, to pick up the tag to energize it or when it passes through one of the antennas. And what happens if someone catches it? Um, well, it's just free floating in the body cavity. So uh, if, if somebody catches the fish and decides to gut it and eat it, the, this tag will probably just come out with all the entrails and never even see it. <laughs> How big will the fish get? Uh, these salmon will go out to the ocean for about 18 months. And when they return, they can return I mean, between 8 and 15 pounds. Wow. It was really great to see that pit tags are constantly allowing us to learn new information about the salmon. Exactly. The pit tags definitely ensured that effort was being made to facilitate fish passage and in turn, protect the fish. Don't go too far, because when AquaKids comes back, we're going to get a behind-the-scenes look at the technology that makes it all happen. Alaska. Alaska. Welcome back to AquaKids. Let's go meet up with Katie and Clark in the field who are getting a look at the technology that allows the entire pit tagging process to occur. Well, John, this looks like a fancy piece of technology. What does it do? Well, Katie, this is the main technology and all sort of the guts of recording the pit tags for the fish. Hmm. So this is how we power it and this is where we record the information. And it would have been nice to have you guys last week. You could have helped us haul it out. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that there's solar panels. Does that mean it's eco-friendly? It is eco-friendly. The biggest problem we have in Alaska is there's no power outlets anywhere. So right. we use solar in the summer to charge our batteries, which is how we power all of the transceivers and receivers. And when we don't have sun in the winter, right. <laughs> then we use a thermal generator to charge our batteries. What is the benefit of having technology like this? Well, the main benefit for us is that we can run this particular system year-round, in winter, in summer, and not have any problems hooking into any sort of electrical outlet or anything like that. How many of these stations do you have out here? Well, on Fish Creek, we have three stations, and this is the lowest part, or the lowest station in the river, and then in Meadow Creek, we have four stations. Does it take a lot of work and upkeep? It does take a little bit of work, so we replace the propane, which is what the thermal generator runs on, weekly if we get a wow. good solar day then we can we can have our batteries run a little bit farther and then we download the data weekly too so even if everything's working fine we're still out here weekly after these stations collect the data what happens to it well we'll come out here with a laptop computer and we'll download the information and the information comes out sort of like a, an excel worksheet mm -hmm. and we can look at the data and say okay well fish one that we tagged way up in big lake is now down here did that fish travel here in two days, three days? How fast was he swimming? How big was he when he was in Big Lake? We get growth information and migration information primarily. So what have you learned from the data you collected? Well, I think one of the coolest things is a fish that is 55 millimeters, so about two, two and a half inches, can travel up to 14 kilometers wow. in about 30 cool. days. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see So that far. the lower part of this, this section all the way up to above Big Lake in about 30 days, and that's a two and a half inch fish. Well, it's great to see that technology like this can be used in such a way to find information that we've never had before. Yeah, the information's been really good for trying to maintain connectivity in the stream, so making sure those culverts can pass fish, not only adults, but also juveniles. And the other thing we don't think about is seasonal movements, so movements in the winter, movements in the summer, and then both upstream and downstream. That technology was really impressive. It was great to see that it was environmentally friendly as well. Right, and not only was it environmentally friendly, but it was also extremely beneficial because it is capable of being run year-round. AquaKids presents Aqua News. Here's our top story. Sockeye salmon are in trouble. Unfortunately, data over the past few decades has indicated that fewer and fewer sockeye salmon are making it back to their original breeding grounds, thus greatly depleting their population numbers. In some locations, data even suggests an 85% decline in the number of fish returning to a spawning site. This statistic has led many scientists to question, why aren't the salmon making it back? Researchers have suggested that changing ocean conditions may be reducing food supply and or increasing the number of ocean predators for the sockeye salmon. However, the causes are still not completely clear. 
Scientists hope that by determining what causes this decline in salmon population, they will be able to reverse the spiraling populations. As Richie Graves, a scientist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association says, we've observed a pattern, and the question is why that pattern is occurring. Hopefully, Graves will be able to find an answer in the near future. I'm Katie from Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now, back to Aqua Kids. Well, it looks like we're out of time for today, but we sure learned a lot about the life of salmon. That's right, Katie. It was awesome to learn about how the Anadromous Waters Catalog and pit tagging are helping to protect and conserve salmon populations. I agree. You know, Drew, salmon are so important to Alaska in the sense that they provide food, money, and a sense of pride for the people in the state. Whether you're from Alaska or not, it is so obvious that salmon are really ingrained in their culture. I couldn't have said it better myself. But it's also important to note that protecting Alaskan salmon takes a lot of effort, and it's a job requiring the work of many. So remember that everyone can do their part to keep this planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website for cool eco tips. And fun links to show you how we can keep the world and the water a great place to play and explore. And, and we'll, we'll see, see you next, next time, time on Aqua Kids. Furniture for the Aqua Kids set provided by IKEA.